Your life or ro your role have changed, I would say, since that crisis in terms of collaboration with other regulators, uh, bringing uh, best practices in the Philippines markets. Can you share that with us? Oh, thank you, Alex. Well, um, the case of the SEC, you're right. After the 2007-2008 financial crisis, there were a lot of changes. Not only in the Philippines, of course, but uh, particularly in the United States when they passed all those laws. And insofar as the Philippines is concerned, there was uh, some sort of uh, realignment with respect to how the financial regulators work. And so there was more, much more emphasis in coordinated efforts like the SEC is part of the Financial Sector Forum, as well as the Financial Stability Coordinating Council. For the Financial Sector Forum, we are there with the uh, BSP, with the PDIC, and the IC. In fact, uh, listening to Tess here, I'm all reminded of all those meetings we've had where the, bet, uh, the lesser half of uh, uh, TESS is present and presents to us all these technical things about financial market infrastructures and uh, how uh, we regulators should uh, uh, go in terms of policy direction. Now, um, with respect to the um, utilities or what you call the... Um, critical utilities of the central counterparty, the central securities depositories, as well as the trade depositories. We all know the uh, pros and cons. We all know the different models that uh, have cropped up. And I know that the Philippines is at that stage that we have to make decisions in each and every aspect of all these uh, changes brought about by uh, IT developments. Now, insofar as the Financial Stability Coordinating Council is concerned, that involves, again, the four agencies of the FSF, but now including also the uh, Department of Finance. And uh, we focus more on um, how to, of course, uh, maintain, uh, manage risks because uh, the problem with the financial crisis, actually, you cannot just act at the time that it happens. You just have to be prepared for it. And one way of really preparing for it is to adapt all these international standards when it, to man when it comes to managing risks. And um, just uh, the other day, we had a meeting with uh, an international organization asking us uh, about the operations of the Financial Stability Coordinating Council. It is a council. It's supposed to have authority and come up with uh, real, as I said, policy directions. But it's actually a de facto body. It has no legal uh, basis in the sense that there is no particular enactment creating the FSCC. So maybe the move should be towards formalizing that council. The other one that I talked about, the financial sector forum, is really just an informal uh, gathering of all the financial regulators uh, and serving as a forum for exchanging information. And uh, it's good that you mentioned trade repositories because if I recall, trade repositories means really uh, collecting data of all the trades so that uh, later on you can analyze and uh, really use that for your uh, operations as a securities exchange. Now with respect to regional, uh, that's supposed to be the local uh, or domestic uh, aspect. The regional, we're of course very active in all the ASEAN initiatives and um, we, the reason why I'm in a hurry to uh, come here and because I have to leave early, I'm actually the chairperson of the ASEAN Corporate Governance Working Committee and we're having a two-day meeting here in Manila to uh, talk about reviewing the uh, ASEAN Corporate Governance Scorecard and the methodology in order that the uh, results or the assessment process would be more uh, updated and would really come up with uh, results that are acceptable to all when it comes to the levels of uh, corporate governance in all the uh, PLCs in the ASEAN region. Uh, other than that, we, I also just got back from a meeting of the ASEAN Capital Market Forum, and uh, that's uh, composed of all the ASEAN member countries, SEC or um, securities regulators, and we did uh, approve at that meeting the ACMF action plan 
for 2016, which is part actually of the uh, ACMF uh, blueprint or roadmap from 2016 to 2025. And um, it talks about mobility of uh, professionals in the region, as well as uh, questions, again, regarding uh, uh, payment systems, clearing, settlement, uh, something that we can agree upon in order that uh, the ASEAN integration would be uh, uh, able to come about uh, in actuality faster. Okay, so uh, in terms of international, well, uh, when it comes to global, and uh, because it's SWIFT that's hosting this event, I would like to focus on one really global effort that is uh, showing as not only uh, a necessity for financial stab stability of the whole world, but also uh, how we move forward. And this is uh, with respect to anti-money laundering efforts, because that one is really one big global undertaking. And we in the Philippines cannot uh, ignore that we are part of that. And uh, I'm speaking not only as a member of the Anti-Money Laundering Council in the Philippines, but also as an ordinary citizen. We have to make uh, our contribution to this uh, fight against uh, money launderers, as well as uh, drug dealers, tax evaders. And the only way to do that really is there should be more transparency and accountability. And when it comes to transparency, the Philippines, I think, is on the spot we really have to do something about our bank secrecy law. And uh, I guess I'll have to end on that because <laughs> that is now uh, something within the power of some other body, which is Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very uh, exhaustive list of a lot of collaborations that are necessary today. I think the anti-money laundering speech has been approved by the, the audience. Uh, Going down to, uh, to the exchange now, so we've talked a lot about collaboration, a lot about uh, resiliency of market infrastructure, standardization. What's happening in the exchange space? Is there as much collaboration between uh, you and your peers? Uh, if so, on what type of topics? Uh, thank you, Alex. There's, uh, right now, I think what we're seeing in the capital market exchange sphere is there's a lot of financial innovation. No? And I think based on our um, analysis of everything that's happening, Regulation cannot be static. You know? If on the one hand there's financial innovation, fintech, I would say there should also be reg tech, regulatory techno um, innovation, re regulatory technology, simply because instruments now are being more sophisticated in terms of the risk management features, right? Um, and I'm, I'm not just referring to instruments, even the venue, even the distribution channels being redefined. If you look at, for example, latency now, if you measure latency um, in terms of execution of trades, then you necessarily will have to go into algorithms. You necessarily will have to go into high-frequency trades. And, and this could pose a lot of systemic risk to the market, as we have seen in the flashcast, for example, of, of May of 2010 in the U.S., when the market really did, did a nosedive within, what, less than a minute, right? So to us, this is primarily a, a, um, what keeps us up at night, the risk considerations. And, and I'm um, discussing this simply because Regulation cannot be static. As I said, if there's fintech, there has to be regtech. Um, what do we do with algorithms? What do we do with um, HFTs? And while we in our market, the exchange already allowed direct market access, right? Um, on the one hand, you could be doing your online trading, the regular online trading, or you could be doing a sponsored access or straight through processing. All of these pose a different set of risks, not just to the front end, especially to the post trade. Your FMIs, your CSDs, your clearing and settlements as well as your central counterparties. So for us, this is very much a concern as we discuss not just locally, but more so regionally and globally. Right? We are not decoupled, we are not uncoupled from the rest of the world anymore you know, when you talk about regulation. So that's number one. Second that we are seeing is competition. Um, and I like the word you used, uh, Alex, evolution, what's happening in terms of evolution. Um, if the human race evolved, and, and there was a theory of uh, Darwin, right, that you, you, you have to be able to survive, Otherwise, you will be rendered extinct. In capital markets, that couldn't be truer too. Now we're fighting for relevance. Why is that so? There's a lot of alternative platforms. You're looking at um, dark pools. You're looking at electronic crossing networks. You're looking at uh, alternative trading systems. All of these offer their own advantages and disadvantages. But what we're saying is now capital is now um, not biased towards just going to exchanges. And we recognize that. 
So competition means we have to offer better services at, I would say, more efficient cost points and probably addressing what is really the needs of the investors, but more so also the institutional and the retail investors. No? We, we view investors not just to be the institutions, but also to be the retail space, right? So um, technology um, now is being redefined, right? You were mentioning, and, and our president, uh, Hans Siegel, was mentioning about blockchain or distributed ledger technology. What comes out of it after all the discussions about blockchain, we will probably benefit from it, whether we are a first mover or we're going to be a latecomer, it's going to be a function of economics, right? If you're looking at the exchange model. Um, some markets have already probably seen some promise in terms of greenfield markets when you look at distributed ledger technology. Our market is different. There's already legacy systems. There's already participants incorporating um, current existing technology. How do you now transplant, right? It's like you're doing a heart transplant. DLT to me is just like doing a heart transplant. You have to check the systemic risk if you are to do electronic ledger technology, right? Um, how does it tie in with your clearing system? How does it tie in even with the settlement? How does it tie in with your CSDs, right? So there's a lot of promise, yes, but ultimately, um, at what cost can you deliver those services if and when there are actual, actual applications? You're still doing the pilot studies on DLTs. We recognize that. But we cannot just sit idle and just close, just turn a blind eye to that. So technology, standards, Looking now at the regional um, collaborations, um, a lot has been said about integration consolidation. We've seen, uh, for example, a 220 plus year old institution, the New York Stock Exchange, purchased by a 15 year startup, the Intercontinental Exchange. Never in my wildest dreams would have I thought uh, a startup purchasing an icon in capital markets, but it happened. Why? Because it's, you're competing against really cash flows, you're competing against a better business model, right? In terms of standards, um, we are also cognizant that um, there's a um, decision point. Do we rationalize, consolidate, or do you just go the mutual recognition route? Right? To us, um, we are guided by the current models in place. For example, if you look at the ASEAN CIS model, um, the Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand, in terms of the mutual funds, the UITFs, they're, they're looking at the MR route. Right? So we're, we're probably going to learn from that. Um, as and when we enlarge the ATL, the... Um, the um, ASEAN trading link, which is now being also rolled out amongst the three um, jurisdictions, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand, and even the passporting system uh, um, initiatives by our um, uh, finance ministers, the regulators, and APEC. Um, what, what ultimately will um, be the core, uh, I would say, takeaways, when you talk about standard harmonization, is that you have to ask yourself, when and how does it become a standard? Right? Because there would be different standard setting bodies, but if, if you... I would share with you, for example, in accounting, is GAAP still the standard or is it IFRS? Now, there's five, six years later, there's a lot of shift. Um, the major markets may have adopted IFRS, but look at the US, they're still standing by GAAP or the other markets, right? So now it's a question of who defines the standards. And, and we feel that's, that's not an easy answer, uh, question to answer, right? Because standards are now set um, in a very complex ecosystem. It's, it's the product that probably is now defining, helping define the standards, simply because financial innovation, financial technology, technology is here to stay. The computing power, Alex, you, you, I remember you told me, the computing power of your iPad now is exactly the same computing power they used when they sent a rocket uh, to the moon for the first time, right? So imagine the potential, and we as regulators, we as market operators, they exchange wears two hats. One is a business enterprise and one is an SRO. We have to be um, a step ahead. We cannot be reactive to all of these. And that requires technical competence. That requires continuous dialogue with our regulators simply because at the end of the day, we are not an isolated market. We are part of a bigger global ecosystem. Absolutely. And uh, I think we covered the, uh, the, the three spectrum of the, the equation for, for, for the market. Maybe we can deep dive because I promised you you would be leaving at 12.30 I prom and, and we will. Uh, we have 15 minutes to go. Um, maybe we can deep dive in one topic that we, you all mentioned which, and is at the heart of what we do at SWIFT which is uh, international standards. And, 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 and maybe uh, starting uh, with, with you, Tess, uh, what, what is the state of adoption of international standards uh, at, at PDTC uh, in terms of, uh, and it's not only about ISO 2022, it's about ISINs and all those type of standards that are out there. 
And in, in your view, what should be the next big project for, uh, in terms of uh, ISO standard or international standards adoption uh, in your context? Well, uh, as Roel pointed out, there's quite a lot of standards out there. But I think for me, where we're coming from, uh, I would refer to the FSB came out with a list of standards for which they they've, did identify what, would what makes a standard a standard. So they, they've uh, identified the parameter, like it has to be something that everybody refers to, it has to be uh, something that a uh, regulated uh, entity, both the regulators recognizes, and are willing to, to, to accept. So on the, on the FSB, there are a list, there's a compendium of standards for which they've, they've again, uh, categorizes them, one for macroeconomics and financial data transparency, that definitely I will not talk about. Then there, there's a group of standards for, for financial regulations and supervision. And lastly, we're in, the one that, would fall, that we're in will be part of would be for the financial and market infrastructure. So in that specific standard, again, that would be the, one of which would be the PFMI, and then another one which is, I would like to look at would be the, this is one, but this standard was uh, published by the ESA. This is really on the financial compliance, financial crime, principles on financial crime, uh, financial crime compliance. So which would, again, this is where the KYC and uh, AML would, would come in, which um, this would also have a corresponding standard, and I think this is be being discussed by the FSB. So, on the PFMI as a CSD, well, we're right now, there are stages of for which we have to implement the principles. We've gone through the self-assessment. We've established where are our weakness versus the standards. And then, I think the next step there is for us to, for which we've highlighted, one of the things that we have to work on are compliance and ensuring that that the standards call that if the financial markets uh, infrastructure would go down, we have to ensure that a maximum of two hours it should be brought up. But of course, we're, we're like, like, like now we're shooting for the fact we're in. There should, it should, uh, the, the shift from a, from a prod to a, to a backup or even to a DR should be, should, should be transparent to the market. And then so in terms of, in terms of fully compliance with the standard, we're not there yet. I would say we are working towards that because these are really standards for which the standards, there are new standards that are being set, uh, uh, set by the regulators for which, we have to we, for which we have to comply with. And then in terms of ISO 20022, which I think it's not just an issue of having, uh, for me, other than the fact that it's standardized, and again, it makes, it facilitates a lot of stuff. For me, it still goes down under, under the, it's part of all the risk management uh, theme, because again, you cannot, you have to standardize everything so that everybody will speak on the same language so that like in, when in a crisis, you would know which data to pull out and you know that a, a, a debt level is really a debt, the definition of debt is the same from one institution or one counterparty or one individual across the, the, the spectrum so that at least when you talk about risk, you know that the risk measurement that you have in place is, makes sense and it makes sense to all entity who are looking, looking at the number. So on the ISO 20022, uh, we've, again, I, I, I've, I've shared this the, in different forums. Uh, I think we're quite lucky because we're in the stage of shifting from our depository system from the old one to a new one because, and then we were able to incorporate it. We're, make, we're making sure that the system is ready for the ISO 20022 because again, I mean, being, being at the front front of all the standard, you have to, migrating to the standard takes every, everyone. It cannot just be the CSD moving forward with the standard. It takes the regulator, it takes all the market, and everyone has to decide that we have to push through with the standard. And I think, again, because with the standards, with infrastructure, with technology comes cost. And uh, I have to say that, yes, indeed, there's a standard, but then there would be, a certain sector of the whole spectrum who might be marginalized because you talk about cost, you talk about investment. So essentially the approach of, from our group, the PDS group, the, the approach is really, yes, you, in terms of technology, you stick with the standard, you follow with the standard because that would really bring you there to the region, to the global market. But then you also have to make sure that you could still keep 
you, there might still be proprietary language when you talk internal or local. Because technically, standards would really be uh, critical, uh, a standard format, standard messaging, when you go across the region, across the country, across the world. But internally, locally, then you may be able to still be able to service proprietary messaging or proprietary formats. Okay, and on the uh, PSC side, you have the same view on uh, ISO 2222, for example, in terms of adoption uh, for the market? Yes, I, I, I think what Tess said is very appropriate. No? We want to speak the same language. In fact, for example, if you look at our, we are an SRO, self-regulatory organization, which allows us to actually come up with rules and regulations that would govern market participants, particularly the um, listed companies as well as the trading participants. No? And, and I think, for example, I'll, I'll mention particularly, uh, we have a standard that we adopted with respect to disclosure as well as listing for mining companies. And this is right around 2006, 2007. We, we were inspired by what they used in Australia, which is the JORC, the Joint o o um, Ore Reserve Code, and we adopted it, right? We, we tweaked it a bit so that we now have a PMRC, which is the Philippine Mineral Reporting Code, right? Why do we do this? Simply because we want to speak the same language. When, when you look at mining companies, the same way when you look at, for example, exchange-traded funds, REITs, all of these are already well accepted, well defined in other jurisdictions, right? So that's one. Um, in terms of modes of listing, for example, we also adopted, um, the, um, if you want to list but you necessarily don't want to raise funds for the first time, then we adopted what they use in Hong Kong or even the U.S. and we called it listing by way of introduction. Right? So th these are examples of standards that would allow us to speak the same language as our peers. Um, and really, it's, it's a way of us opening up to the world. We are not anymore a closed um, economy or closed exchange. And, and the only way for you to do that is for you to actually standardize not just processes, but also really the, the rules of the game, mm -hmm. right? And, but that being said, we are also cognizant or aware that standards um, adopted in other jurisdictions may not be totally applicable to the local setting. No? Um, we've seen what happened in China when they tried to tinker with the uh, circuit breaker rule, right? And, and they were just probably also uh, moving along with the response of the market. And, and that, that, while people might say they didn't know what they were doing, I would say they're actually the experts when it comes to their market. So they, they have material information that definitely came into consideration when they came up with the um, circuit breaker thresholds, right? So that's the same view that I would take whenever we are at the decision point to whether uh, to adopt a certain standard or to probably come up with a localized, customized version. It's a question of adoption versus, I would say, customization. And it's never a black or white proposition. It, it always depends on the risks. It always depends ultimately on the buy-in, not just from the regulators also, but really the users, the trading participants, the, the financial intermediaries, as well as the, um, the quibs and the retail public ultimately, right? So um, yes, we, we see that international best practices and standards, um, and that's, that's a mouthful when you say international best practices, right? We have to do a deep dive on what exactly do you want to regulate. And, and we, we are now taking what probably a, a, a review, do you do a soft touch approach in the sense that the market knows best? We know that that's necessarily true, right? Are markets still efficient? The efficient mi market hypothesis is that does that still hold, notwithstanding what we saw in 07, 08, right? Markets are rational. It's always been believed to be the case. But somehow it's always human behavior, human nature. Greed is greed. People would sometimes they say less wants more and more wants all as the truism goes, right? So there's always that psychologic, psychology of finance that we as a market regulator will have to be always taking consideration of, right? As we develop more standards, and how do we do this? Uh, how do we know the thought processes that go into the financial um, ecosystem? We do our regular dialogues. We are not detached from the participants. In fact, um, any given day, we're always in touch with especially the locals as well as the foreign and regional, right? And it's incumbent on us to process that information, not necessarily just take it hook, line, and sinker. We have the distinct responsibility to see the adaptability of those standards, right? Um, do, we, do we allow short selling only for the most liquid securities? Um, do we have still the, the, the optic rule is in the law, but how and when can you actually provide for exceptions? These are examples of operational day-to-day -day, um, standards that, that we have to address as a regulator. And, as I said at the start, the new normal is, is um, with us now, right? Things are now already being redefined, and, and we embrace that. We embrace the ambiguity. At the same time, we embrace the opportunities that a new set of standards will present to our market.
Thank you. And actually, as, as closing words on, this, on the Securities Commission side, uh, what do you think is your role in terms of uh, supporting the adoption of international standards or even promoting or even forcing onto the market some of those standards if you feel appropriate? Well, um, I appreciate the efforts of our two exchanges to come up to international standards. In fact, uh, I know particularly that uh, PDEX has, uh, even last year, started uh, complying with the uh, international resiliency standards and that uh, somehow uh, it was uh, put on hold. And of course, the um, stock exchange has uh, provided uh, PSE trade decks, direct market access, and uh, you've also helped uh, tremendously in raising corporate governance through your Bell Awards. As a regulator, you also have to comply with uh, standards. In fact, uh, the main standards that we have to attain are the IOSCO standards. And again, I hate to mention it again, the reason why we are not a full member of IOSCO is because of our bank secrecy law. So unless we become part of the uh, IOSCO Multilateral Memorandum of Understanding on Information Sharing or Exchange, we cannot also be a signatory to some of the initiatives in the ASEAN. So we cannot sign off on the uh, CIS, uh, we cannot sign off on the funds passport, we also cannot sign off on the other disclosure, standardization, and uh, common prospectus uh, initiatives. But we do, and I know that PSE is preparing to be part of the ASEAN trading link. Uh, it has, it's already operational, but I think they're also trying to uh, review the structure such that other countries like the Philippines can uh, easily join. So um, where are we at, at present? We realize that uh, there's a difference between consolidating operations as opposed to harmonizing uh, standards when it comes to our regulated entities. Uh, I recall that uh, we passed recently our new implementing rules of our securities regulation code, and we did require certain things from uh, brokers particularly, and these are not really what you would call um, advanced technology, but we did see some resistance, like for example, we uh, required them to put up an electronic database such that they would have all this uh, data about their accounts, uh, all their clients, and also things that uh, the SEC would normally audit uh, if necessary. And then we also required them to put up in their websites pictures and names of their salespersons because, uh, you know, recently there was this problem about a person pretending to be a licensed broker and all that and we're trying to get uh, investments from the public. So um, little things like this, they may not be as far advanced as uh, uh, the other countries, but uh, these are things that would help the investing public and that's really the primary goal of a regulator is really to protect the investing public. We uh, hope that by uh, complying with all these standards, ultimately the ones that will benefit will be the investing public. We talk about integration, we talk about consolidation, but uh, really maybe how will it benefit the investing public maybe in terms of uh, putting down friction costs, or lowering fees, and uh, maybe also uh, if you have a depository which will have a particular uh, way of uh, managing risks uh, in the sense that it will avoid uh, what you would call anomalies in the uh, settlement or the one that we actually wanted PSE to mandate is the name on central depository because right now there are omnibus accounts in our depository and that doesn't help at all in terms of transparency. Okay, so uh, do you have five minutes for questions, Teresita? Yes? Yeah, okay, so maybe we can have five uh, questions from the audience to conclude. Or not? I don't see anybody because we're blinded by the... Uh, 
yeah, it's lunchtime, so people want to go for lunch. I guess maybe then I can conclude that, I don't know if you've seen, if you noticed in the, uh, in the slides of volumes, that the uh, volumes of securities on the SWIFT network for Asia Pacific has increased by 35% from last year uh, in, in Asia Pacific only, while in Europe it's only 2% increase. So it really shows, of course, the volatility of the markets during the crisis in China.